Hey everybody, I'm Lewis Bold and today we're talking safer schools. Mass shootings are an unfortunate reality in the United States, but our creative problem solvers around the country are finding solutions to make sure our children are whole, our schools are safe, and our law enforcement are properly trained. Outside of San Antonio, advanced law enforcement rapid response training, teaching officers how to take on active shooters. It simply slides in like that. Door barricades, locks, and alert systems. A Michigan company's products proved successful in one school shooting, now selling like gangbusters to others. We'll show you their latest products. In Houston, it takes a village. Whether it's problems at home, academic challenges, or behavioral issues, an early intervention program seeks to keep children whole before small issues escalate. Trust me, you're gonna shut those people down and those kids down. Can an anti-bullying campaign prevent mass shootings? We explore in Orlando. And in Jacksonville, we show you how attack-resistant doors and windows can help fortify a school. I'm Lewis Bold, and this is Solutionaries. There are so many examples. Police say a shooter struck Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown Friday morning. Children and teachers targeted, killed in class. Evil visited this community today. The latest attack in Uvalde has administrators across the nation looking at school safety. We take every student who comes through those doors and our job is to ensure when they're inside of our domain that they are safe. With 130,000 students in 196 schools, that's no easy effort for Duval County Public Schools in Jacksonville. This is one of many districts nationwide making a deal with a private security company called Armored One. The group has contracts with schools in almost every state. With such an important issue, we wanted to see what this company is all about. We flew to its headquarters in Syracuse, New York. It's where experts train, test, and transform to make schools safer. But before we can look at this, we need to examine the problems. Why did you start this company? It was the night of the Sandy Hook attack, December 14th, 2012, that we got our start. My wife was a city school teacher here in Syracuse, and between the two of us, we had six children. And I realized on that day, even as a SWAT operator, as a homicide detective, that I couldn't get to my kids quick enough. A veteran SWAT officer, Tom Chiz, knew he could do better. He teamed up with his friend, Tino Amade, an operations manager. We know it's not just one solution, right? One solution isn't gonna make a difference. It's putting a many different puzzle pieces together. The team studies mass shootings, visiting the scenes and putting together reports. They've found common themes. The shooters showed warning signs before the attacks. They've typically scoped out the campuses prior. They attack during school hours. They want an easy entrance, coming in through an open door or shooting through the glass. They also desire to see their victims, so they shoot at close range. At 12.03 p.m., there were as many as 19 police officers in the hallway. Those 19 officers stayed there for 48 minutes. They're met with little resistance and have several minutes, if not longer, inside the school before they're killed or captured. What are the physical problems with most schools in America right now? Most schools in America right now, I think the biggest issue is that it's easy to get into your school and it's easy to, to have an attack on a school because they're not prepared. There's a lot of schools out there that are just not prepared for something like this. And you know, during a time like this, we're not that far away from Robb Elementary being attacked, right? And so schools are thinking, okay, what do I do? What's the quickest way for me to make a difference right now? Just look at the numbers from the National Safety Security Protection Agency. They analyzed school shootings from 1970 to 2021. Data shows 545 people have been killed. More than 1,500 were injured in American school shootings during that time period. 
2021 had the most school shootings on record, 139 in a single year. The goal is to deter a shooter from entering at all. But if they try, the next step is to slow them down and keep them out of crowded areas as police respond. Armored One preaches a three-prong approach, threat assessment, teacher and staff training, and technology to fortify a campus. We do know it includes assessments of campus to look for vulnerabilities. You're seeing this a uh, commonplace in, in a lot of workplaces around the United States that you have these layers of security that you're being vetted at different points before you just enter the building proper. Uh, schools should absolutely be the leaders in this. They're the ones that everybody should be vetted on the outside and have these procedures to just kind of uh, slow down the process and make sure that we're looking at everything with a uh, discerning eye. Armored One manufactures attack-resistant film and glass, which go on windows and doors. They point out it is not bulletproof, but it can still make a big difference. We went to the range to test it out. All right, we're going hot. Chiz shows us what it's like to shoot traditional tempered glass. One pistol shot and one punch, and the shooter is in. The shooter needs to reach in and unlock a door. That's all they're looking for. This film the company makes goes on after a window's in place. It takes a few bullets and cuts down on the shooter's visibility. Clear. So now we're going to transition to a baseball bat. But it doesn't take long to breach the door. That's failure. Finally, we get a demonstration of the company's safety glass. This has an outer layer of film and a thicker layer in between two panes of glass. We're going hot. Then he let me put it to the test. So this glass has 70 rounds in it from an AR-15 and then a nine millimeter handgun. We have some small holes, but the question is, am I going to be able to break through it with this baseball bat? That takes another several minutes, giving students and staff the time to run, hide, and barricade. Plus, police have a chance to rush in. The team here even tests their products in attack-resistant doors using a battering ram with 250 pounds of pressure. Three, two, one. You may be wondering the cost. Armored One glass is about 15 to 20 percent more expensive than a typical window pane. It's a price the company says is well worth it. All of this costs money though, and it's a big chunk in an already strained budget for many school districts. It's true, I mean, you, you got limited budgets, you got um, you know, inflation happening, you got legislation making changes, you know, taking things away from our schools, making it more difficult, but that doesn't change the fact that there's a problem in our society. And that we can't, just because we can't afford it doesn't mean we can't ignore it too at the same time. Couple this with an on-campus alert system and top-notch training, and Armored One claims schools will be significantly safer. I would say 80% of our buildings are not built for true security to protect. And I'm not talking, we don't want your place to look like a prison. We actually want the most gorgeous looking, relaxed atmosphere for these kids, but it's gotta be done right. What has been your proudest moment since you started the company? Our proudest moment so far has been stopping an attack on a school. A teen attacker, high on drugs, came back to the school that expelled him. He had a weapon, but the protocols were in place and he couldn't get through the single entry door. Staff and students knew what to do. They were able to get out of hallways, into safe rooms to get people out of the building that needed to be out of the building, and were able to hold him at bay up near the front entry for about eight minutes before police arrest him at gunpoint. And it's hard to say how many he could have killed or injured that day. And even saving one life is worth the effort.
It's a story we've told too many times before. The young man accused of taking the lives of 19 fourth graders and two teachers in Uvalde, Texas, was bullied as a child. It's a common thread we see among school shooters over and over again. 70% is the statistics that I have read. Mary Crownover is a nationally certified and licensed school psychologist who worked for Central Florida's largest school district, Orange County, for nearly two decades. She believes in order to stop telling that same story, we need to switch up the strategy in schools and teach the youngest children about bullying instead of waiting until they are bullied or turn into bullies. It is my position and the position of school psychologists nationally. Like there's an actual position statement from the National Association of School Psychologists that all students K through 12, the, the moment they step in our educational doors, that they receive education to prevent bullying. Can anybody tell me what bullying is? So in Osceola County, Florida, yeah, well, you. Just down the road from the happiest place on earth. Nothing can be done at school to reduce bullying. Is that fact or myth? The local sheriff. That's correct. Is speaking straight to the smallest of students, elementary schoolers. So anytime you see someone that is being a victim of a bully, you go out, you talk to them, you tell them, hey, that's not right. It takes all of you here together to make sure that we help prevent bullying, okay? He says since the proof is there, since elementary school is where so many school shooters are first bullied. Only boys bully. Is that a fact or myth? All right. That's right, girls bully too, right? Yep. This is where he's bringing his bullying prevention message. All 30 of his elementary schools starting this school year. You know, when I first uh, took office, a lot of parents were concerned um, with the bullying in schools. and the increase in um, active shooters who a lot of times they'll say they were bullied and cyber bullied. Sheriff Marcos Lopez says the anti-bullying talk in middle and high schools comes too late. Roles are established. Both bullies and their victims have been formed. In fact, data from the Osceola County School District shows most incidents of bullying, harassment and threats happened in their middle schools, 217 last year. Elementary schools were next with 130 incidents, and high schools had the fewest, only 84 incidents last year. So maybe if we target them a little bit earlier and make sure that they're understanding at an earlier age before they get into that, uh, understanding the relationship and understanding, you know, um, the real, real uh, reasoning behind um, what's wrong and what's right, what can get you in jail, what, what can't get you arrested. And I think it'll help prevent them and deter right. them from doing this once they get a little bit older. Next one is spreading rumors is a form of bullying. Is that a fact or myth? Fact. Lopez says this is the first time the sheriff's office has ever brought these life lessons into Osceola County Elementary Schools because it's time to try something new. Once you start going to that seventh, eighth, ninth, I mean, these kids nowadays, they know it all. Um, you know, and, and, and we rather make sure that we're really treating it at the root. And if we can, this is all I know right now, and it's, it's just like an educated guess. Um, it's not 100 proof, but it's a start. You really believe, Sheriff, as these kids grow up, that this could prevent mass shooting? Well, you know, as we've seen all over the nation, uh, every active shooter that, we've, that they've apprehended alive is blaming it on he's been bullied. Bully, bully this, bully. I don't know if it's an excuse or if it's just a copycat excuse, but as of right now, you know, we don't have anything other to go on. So I'm thinking if we can start addressing and raising the anti-bullying uh, at a lower level and making these children, when they're smaller, second, third, fourth grade, realize this is wrong, you'll see a lot less of it. The bullying prevention program is really about building the child's resistance to bullying and victimization and harassment to even occur, whether you're the bully or the victim. So bully prevention education is really teaching the child to be a socially, emotionally healthy human. Mary Crownover, the school psychologist, says the earlier children learn about bullying, how to protect themselves and protect their peers, the better they'll all be. 
Will it do what the sheriff is intending, which is preventing kids from turning into hardened bullies as they grow up? Yes, and it will also prevent more victims for the bullies to choose. But Crownover says one lunchroom lesson like this once a year isn't enough. It's not enough time and it's not enough involvement. You cannot educate a child and expect him to survive in an environment five days a week for seven hours a day that doesn't support his beliefs. So if he believes that bullying is wrong and he is being taught that he's supposed to not stand by and watch someone be bullied, that he's supposed to intervene because it's not correct. But the environment that he's in is not supporting it. We have not made any change. Crownover wants to see the anti-bullying talk worked into the weekly curriculum at elementary schools to involve teachers and parents. And the teachers are teaching it, right? So they're already in the classroom. And then if there's homework assigned, just like there's math homework and reading homework, then the parents are gonna be involved. And perhaps in that homework, there is a component that the parents have to be involved, right? You, you like this so much that you'd like to see it expanded. You'd like to see it expanded to parents and teachers, um, give them bullying homework so the parents would have to get involved. Yes. Yes. You know, parents should be involved. You know, you, as a parent, you should ask your child, how'd your day go? You know, your, your child might be a victim of a bully. Ask them, hey, are you okay? What happened today? They don't want to talk about it. There's a problem. But also, you as a parent, you might have a child who's a bully. And if your child is a bully, then you have a problem. You need to start addressing that issue. Because we can't catch them all. We can't address them all. We can only address the ones that we catch and are brought to our attention. But as a responsible parent, you really need to be talking to your child, making sure that they understand that bullying is bad. This is, this is not real. This is fake. You're just going to say, I don't like your shirt. How's that? I don't like your shirt. Okay. And that hurt your feelings, right? For now, the school district says Stand it's up. counting on the sheriff. That's why you have to say something if you see something, because that way we could put a stop into that bullying before it becomes into something much more serious like a crime. And his school resource officers to teach the bullying prevention right. message, at least in elementary school. Bullied. And even the sheriff admits that might not be enough. You know, there's no perfect uh, system to try to help prevent anything. All we can do is try and try new things and experiment. But earlier is better than later. And something is better than nothing, says Mary Crownover. And so will this prevent school violence down the road? Yes because our students and therefore our population of young people will be emotionally healthier, more resilient, have better coping skills for when bad things do happen, and they'll be emotion, you know, they'll be healthier. So less violent. If you're barricaded, they can't access you. Facts have never been more important than now. They can be the difference between life and death. Rely on the Trust Index, your first line of defense against disinformation. Just look for the seal. It's true means it passed the test, and we can back it up. Not true means it's fake. Don't trust it. And be careful means not entirely right or wrong, but it could be risky. In the battle against disinformation, no fact is off the table. If it seems suspicious, send it to us and we'll get answers. Look for the Trust Index on the stations and websites of Graham Media Group. Right after the Uvalde shooting, uh, June picked up and it's been nonstop.
This summer has been the busiest on record for Nightlock, a security device provider in mid-Michigan. You take a phone call and you have five emails while you're on the phone, and it's been like that. It started in December with Oxford, and it really hasn't let up since. A quarter of Nightlock's annual sales were shipped just in June, and owners believe the tragic school shootings in Oxford and Uvalde, as well as school districts wanting to prepare for the upcoming school year, contributed to the dramatic increase in sales. Now, these four skids sitting here are going to West Virginia, Virginia, one of them is going to Dallas, the other one I think is going to Pennsylvania. Based in Mount Morris, Nightlock is less than an hour from Oxford High School, which had their devices in place. Knowing that our door barricades were on those doors and watching those kids in those classrooms, um, it just felt good that our door locks were protecting kids. It's a simple product that's proven effective. We have two styles of door barricades, and this one right here is engaged with the floor. It simply slides in like that. Then we have this one that engages with the door frames. So um, this one uh, has a floor plate and they both withstand about 1,500 pounds of force. To give you a sense of just how much demand has increased, Nightlock was getting about 5,000 locks in every month. Now they're seeing upwards of 20,000, and they're shipping 50 of these boxes every single day. School safety expert Tom Meinsberg is a former Michigan State Police SWAT team leader. He says deadbolt locks can get expensive and recommends districts consider door stoppers. If people barricade it, stay in place, and put up the obstacles, you know, you got about a five minute survival survive window. That's what they had in Oxford. They had to survive five minutes before the police were there encountering the suspect. If you're barricaded, they can't access you. Meinsberg says it's design simplicity and price tag make Nightlock a competitive option for school districts. We're never going to get 100% of the threats. There's some individual out there that's very hidden. Um, we're not going to be able to avoid it. And if my training is basically once it's compromised, then you minimize the impact and I, I, you know, by keeping people behind barricaded areas. After several devastating mass shootings, the mid-Michigan company is expanding its product line. They are fire retardant, blackout material, and they block the view. And they're made right here in Michigan? Yes, yes, right here in Mount Morris. During an active shooter event, the protocol says, lock the door, turn out the lights, cover the window, hide the kids. So you want to cover the windows so the bad guy can't see into the classroom to see any targets. So we have blackout shades uh, that we patented and um, we started selling about a year and a half ago and they're really popular. They've also created an early alert notification system so that when a security lock is activated, everyone in the school is notified immediately. Everybody expects that the shooter is going to come in the front door, you know, but Maybe he carried it in with him in a, in a backpack. You don't know when it's going to happen. It could be inside a classroom. It could be in the hallway or a bathroom. So if a teacher in one end of the building um, knows she needs to go into lockdown, um, but she doesn't have time to call 911, then it puts out the message right, right away to the police, administrators, other teachers, and, and the ball gets rolling quicker and the emergency responders get there quicker. You have to stay on the cutting edge of things for security purposes. I mean, the threats are getting faster, um, closer together. Um, if you're not evolving and creating new products, then you're, you're, behind, you're putting these people at risk and you're not doing your best to protect them. You gotta keep trying, you gotta keep pushing forward and try your best to have the best solutions that you can. Every lock helps. Maureen Castle is an assembly worker during the summer months, but during the school year, she's a cook at an elementary school in Genesee County. And she says the work she does at school and here in the warehouse is making a difference. I think it did help in Oxford, and I think that it can help in other schools. And it's just another solution, you know, that can help. It's not everything, but it's a solution that can help, and I hope it helps. Even if it helps just a few, you know, it's worth it. It's one solution in a complex scenario with clear limitations. While the terms mental health and gun control have often been relegated to buzzwords, experts know there are a million pieces to solving this puzzle. We're probably never going to eradicate the whole problem, you know. Um, humans are human, and um, people have issues 
and and you just have to be prepared. Um, your staff has to know how to recognize issues uh, with the students and other staff members. The device that the responders can't get through it secures the room, but if they can't uh, open it from the outside to release it, the fire marshal won't let them have. Michigan is one of the states, there's 11 states that have written legislation to allow classroom door barricade devices. There's some antiquated codes that were written in the 70s and so when the codes are not updated um, to the new standards that have been written in to allow for classroom door barricade devices, states will get pushback from their fire marshals. And one of the biggest things was, so we have 11 states that allow their students to be secured and sheltered in place. But what about all these other 39 states? Like how do we get it so that we make, we tell the story so that everyone can be secured? And it doesn't have to be our product, it can be any product. Um, it's just how do we secure these classrooms and make these kids safe when these things happen. I wish we had products that covered the whole school, maybe the front door, um, cameras, uh, window, glass uh, protection. I'm thankful they were in Oxford. Um, I wish there could have been something more for Uvalde and, and all the other schools, but it's just, it's not a simple solution. I was scared for my life. Nobody should go through this. Unfortunately, I thought that after Santa Fe, we were really making some progress. The shooter shot through the window. If the shooter was going to come in, we just ran out of the room. But it, everything that happened in Uvalde told me. Why did he do this? There may be other clues out there right now that we're not aware of. It's just not working. Michael Matranga, I'm the current owner, founder of uh, M6 Global Defense Group. Uh, I'm a former United States Secret Service agent, uh, former counter assault team operator under the Secret Service's Special Operation Division, and then Presidential Protective Detail Agent. It's everybody's responsibility. It doesn't matter if it's at school or if it's in your community. You need to learn uh, the the uh, you know signs and symptoms of pre-attack behavior. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen at a K-12 campus. It may happen in uh, a grocery store like in Buffalo. It may happen in your church like at Southern Springs. Or it can be an 18 year old kid that goes to the elementary that's school. That's right, that's right. You know, um, m many times after every one of these shootings, it's always said, well, yeah, I knew that that kid had some issues and there's no one that has reported that behavior, just like in Uvalde with Ramos. You know, it's now coming out uh, that he had, uh, you know, substantial oh, issues. There was, there was there was a ton on Ramos. There's a ton. Having one threat assessment team for a district is not enough. Having a campus threat assessment team on every campus is not enough. We have to go deeper than that. We have to have a community resource or a resource within the district that's going to help treat the cause. We build hundred million dollar stadiums for high schools, but, we, but yet we can't find you know, $100,000 or $200,000 annually to support a social emotional learning or emotional intelligence program for our, our staff, our students, and our parents. You know, in the case of Robb Elementary in Uvalde, a lot has come out that the shooter was likely bullied for the way he dressed, the way he spoke, possibly his family. He also had hundreds of days that he was absent from school, didn't drop out, was actually involuntarily withdrawn. Nothing, nothing will ever excuse his actions, but what is not so clear is whether anybody at any point tried to intervene in that kid's life. In our area, operating in dozens of schools across Houston, across the state of Texas, and across the country, there is a program that is trying to bring an entire community of support into the school. So those kids who are most at risk for whatever reason are shown there is help, and there is a different way to go. You never cry unless you're in a dilemma, and I was in a dilemma. My first name is Yolanda. My son's name is Keith. And that's your, that's his handsome face on that brochure. That's his handsome face. <laughs> okay, tell me about that. What was that picture for? That picture right there was, he went to Hollow. We met Mr. Renfro here. We was kind of like in a dilemma. We had lost our house, and we was homeless. So 
the school with Mr. Renfro helped us to get into a hotel so that we can be able to get things organized. They even had it so that um, the kids would still go to the school and uh, they had transportation to come and pick them up. Mr. Renfro was kind of like um, a guard dog, <laughs> if I may say, which is a good one, because he was there at everything. My name is Porter Renfro the fourth. I'm a student support manager for A-Leaf ISD through CIS community schools. Students have a, a lot of need for different things. Primarily uh, here is food, clothing, backpacks, school supplies. So they know, all know that my room is like a one-stop shop if they actually mm -hmm. left something at home or if they just don't have it. We can almost provide anything, and I always say from a, a pencil to rent that's late, months. Anything that we can do to remove the barriers that's stopping them from being successful. The challenges that we see in, in the families that we work with can sometimes be severe. Some kids may have some needs that, that some of the campus administrators may not know about. And that's where we come in and try to fill that need. Communities and schools, the largest dropout prevention program in the nation, is about providing integrated services to empower students to stay in school and achieve in life. We assess what our students need. Um, oftentimes we, um, we reach out uh, to our teachers. We talk to our teachers first about the social-emotional piece of our students um, and the needs. It's not just only academic, but there are social needs that our students need. If a family is in a situation where there are those kinds of stressors, like food insecurity, housing insecurity, then that does you know, impact students' well-being. And so that's where the mental health support, wellness support, uh, really is vital. A part of our role on the campus is to give that uh, confidence to them, let them know that they can do it, um, cheer them on, um, show them in some cases how to do it and how it can be done. Um, use examples from the community as well as your own personal examples. So the potential, you see it, you help them to realize their potential and so they can be successful and then move in a different direction and realize that it doesn't have to be this way, it could be greater and you show them how it can be greater. It's a blessing. It helped me because it take a village to help raise kids. When he started community in school, I seen a big change. They stuck by him and motivated him like another father figure. I mean, he's very independent and he never was one that just hang out on the streets. He was always about, about his business and taking care of himself. So I have a catering business. Um, I started in 2020. I specialize in soul food and Cajun food. You really, I mean, your face changes when you talk about your business. You right. really light up. How, yeah. how important is that to you? Very important, very important. I take pride into my work, uh, take my time. I make sure that uh, all my customers are satisfied and yeah, they love it. They love it. So I have my little brother and my nephew, which they're a young of age. So once they go out to be 16 and time for work, they will know, you know, how to work, how to work going, how to get paid, how to be, you know, work on time and the work that they, that they need to know. Do you have anything you like to cook in particular? Um, Favorite dish? Yes. What? Fried chicken. Fried chicken? Mm -hmm. Do you have any kind of special way you do it or anything? Uh, no, I just do it. I just do it his way, DJ way. The DJ way, <laughs> I like that. Okay, all right. How critical was communities and schools to your son's success? Very critical. Very critical. Do you think he'd be in college now without the program? He would have because he got a praying mom, but he also um, had someone to enhance him a little bit more. And he had people that was looking forward to him moving to that next level and was telling him, was feeding him, hey, I know you can do it, Keith. I know you got it in you. Just study a little harder. You have to train them constantly. You have to equip them with the equipment that they need if they're gonna perform on the day when the attack happens. Sit back and enjoy the next half hour. Yeah, that's right, because we have nothing but good news to bring to you, the kind of news that you want to share.
And to see those little faces on those crosses, it's, it's not right. This should not have been something that happened. I've never been scared like this before. If we don't change nothing, it's gonna be the same and it's gonna happen again and again. It's unbelievable. And your mind instantly goes back to the kids that you know in your life. The ones that are supposed to be enjoying those last days of school, hanging out with their friends and laughing. And to know that they spent those last few moments of their life in terror, it's emotionally scarring. So many parents are, are just trying to come to terms with the news that they're hearing today. People really all over the country who have come here to pay their respects to the 21 victims of the Robb Elementary shooting. These are not just headlines. These are people's lives. These are lives that were lost that day. Whenever you have a situation like that that unfolds and when you see that delayed response, it's it turns to anger and frustration. So what you see is the typical re police response time is about three minutes. So that's lightning fast. You're not going to get any faster than that unless you're lucky and there just happens to be a police officer standing right there when it starts. Of course, the event doesn't end just because that first officer arrives on scene. And so that's the number we're talking about from 911 call to first officer on scene is about three minutes. Obviously then the officer has to figure out where the attacker is, go find the attacker and stop the killing. So that can take longer than that. I'm Pete Blair, I'm the Executive Director of the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Center at Texas State University. We're currently out at our range facility uh, in Maxwell, Texas. We actually have a staff of researchers who are involved in looking at not only the events to find out what the patterns and trends are in the events, but also at specific techniques and tactics and how those work and comparing which ones work better than the others. And then we publish that in peer-reviewed journals. They heavily rely on that research to guide them in understanding these situations that happen and how to better prepare for that. Anytime we have a major attack, there's always an uptick in the number of requests, but our requests have gone up about tenfold uh, in the month following Uvalde and have continued on from there. Each kit is designed to allow the location that receives the kit to teach the entire course. So it's got all the equipment you need to teach our particular courses. We can either send our instructors out to the location and they teach the course themselves, or we also have a train the trainer program that's designed to have that agency develop their own trainers that can then provide that training. Each situation is not the same. They can only take what they learn from one situation and apply it to the next. You have to train them constantly. You have to equip them with the equipment that they need if they're going to perform on the day when the attack happens. It's not like just being a police officer gets you experience and all of a sudden you're this tactical genius who can handle these complex situations. So because you're not developing that practice and that skill on the job every day, you have to train to develop that skill so on those rare days that you do need it, you have that skill set in place. We actually do something. When you see something, you hear something, and then you say something, then we're going to do something.
be sure to subscribe to our Solutionaries channel. We're just getting started. Because anytime a tragedy happens like Uvalde, Texas, everybody wants to do something. And gadgets are not going to help us. There's been several things that we think that uh, could have potentially taken a path of violence, but maybe we derailed that before it got there. I'm Chris Perkins. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for Roanoke City Public Schools. Well, the research tells us, uh, Secret Service and Department of Education conducted this research, uh, tells us that the K-12 school attacker and approximately 81% of the time is going to tell someone their intention. And approximately 59% of the time, uh, that school attacker will tell more than one person. So we've got to create ways to build relationships and trust. But most importantly, we've got to create ways that if I do see something, I need an avenue to say something so I don't take ridicule or bullying because I may have I told on another person. And so anonymous tip lines is one way or, or one uh, avenue that we can uh, go down. There's been several things that we think that uh, could have potentially taken a path of violence, but maybe we derailed that before it got there. I'm Rhonda Stegall, Assistant Superintendent of Roanoke County Public Schools. We have the See Something, Hear Something, Say Something campaign. We have a 24-7 monitoring system called Speak Up, where um, anybody, students, uh, parents, community members can make a report on that line. On any of these tips, there's something happening, uh, and it's our job to get to the bottom of it, work with the parents to help get support. If it's um, an immediate issue uh, where you know, there's a possibility of danger, it'll be 911 to be contacted and the local police will be involved. If it's something that, you know, oh, I saw something that's odd, uh, that individuals, that they, they're generally very happy, but there's something wrong, we can take that information and work with. Because a lot of the times, there, there's commonalities with school attackers. There is no specific profile, but as an example, a commonality is, like I said, the 81% will tell someone. Another commonality is 91% use a handgun. The tip line at the rudimentary foundation of this is a very beneficial tool going forward to complement all the other things that we are trying to do as a school system. The limitations really are than the lack of reporting. So um, there's lots of things out there and we hear the same things that the Secret Service report said. Oh, we thought they were kidding. When we do threat assessments, we will ask our students, you know, did you hear anything about, oh yeah, I saw it, I heard it, I didn't think they were serious. He does that stuff all the time, I didn't, you know. Um, so it's the getting past that hesitancy to report. So we've had uh, multiple localities, even outside of our state of Virginia, reach out to us interested in the campaign and wanting to use our poster and our information. So we've shared that information. So uh, we're proud of um, this campaign. However, it can be better because we want more reporting. And the way we can do that is to educate. And that's what we started this year, educating uh, our stakeholders. And we want them to feel comfortable to report and to see that we actually do something. When you see something, you hear something, and then you say something, then we're going to do something. And if we go through a proper risk assessment or threat assessment based on that information we receive, then we can prevent that. And that has happened. We have worked through those. And we have been blessed in that we have created this culture of safety in our, in our school system to where I, I believe that the majority of our students feel comfortable going to an adult and saying, I saw this. We've benefited from that. We have, we have stopped things, you know, people from hurting themselves, people from hurting others, because this information came through. There is a lot to discuss here, and we'd like to hear your opinions. Drop a comment below and make sure you hit subscribe to stay up to date with Solutionaries.